what's going on in the world today, then you've come to the right place. Welcome to Southern Sense Talk Radio with your host, Annie, the Radio Chicky Bellis, and featuring Curtis C.S. Bennett and the most interesting guests that you'll find anywhere on Internet Radio. So sit back, relax, and remember, Southern Sense is common sense. All right, and welcome back to another adventure here on Southern Sense. You're listening live, not just on Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, uh, X, uh, <laughs> half a dozen other places, <laughs> but it's very easy. Just go to the name of the show, Southern Sense, as in common sense, southernsense.net, and watch live on our home webpage with a chat room available for you. I'm your hostess with the least most sister, Radio Chickadee, Annie, along with my co-host, the one and the only, Curtis C.S. Bennett. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow, Curtis, we have a lot going on and a lot to talk about. We've got two great guests. Uh, returning to the show is John O'Connor. He now hosts his own podcast based upon the book he wrote. It's called The Mysteries of Watergate Podcast, and his book is Postgate, How the Washington Post Betrayed Deep Throat, Covered Up Watergate, and Began Today's Partisan Advocacy Journalism. So he'll be starting with the first half of the show. And I do know that you have to leave early uh, to attend Mm -hmm. a a rally for We Can Be Heroes Foundation with Uh, Laura Lerma and Roger Stone. And you're also a speaker there in uh, Jacksonville, Florida. But the second half of the show, we're going to have Peter Navarro. And he's got a brand new book that just came out called A New MAGA Deal. And that's going to be interesting. Now, you got to also remember, Peter Navarro was the first time a member of a presidential staff has been sent to prison for contempt of Congress. Never in this nation's history has anyone had to do that. And considering Rahm Emanuel of his contempt of Congress and various others' contempt of Congress, failure to show up, uh, Anthony Fauci, We can name a lot of people on both sides of the aisle, but ironically, most of them are on the left, who have never had their hands or wrists even slapped. What about that Eric Eric, Eric Holder? Nope. No Eric Holder? Hmm. Oh, wait a minute. Didn't he become... um, He was the attorney general at the time, right? Oh, yeah. Ah, The Fast and the Furious. Yeah. Gun running. Yeah, which we reported on this show when it first broke, and we still have never gotten answers, and that's been 15 years. 15 years since that scandal, and we've never gotten answers. Uh, yet, no contempt of Congress. Only and I believe, Navarro. I believe a, a lot of that is because our, our side doesn't have the backbone to go after the Democrats. You know, so especially if they're black Democrats, they don't want to be called racist. So they give him a pass. Oh, man. Oh. Justice is supposed to be blind in this country. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's the law for thee and not for me. That's their mm-hmm. attitude. And uh, hopefully, hopefully, knock on wood, this next election will put Trump back into the White House. And we can then start to bring back our constitutional rights. Uh, with that said, um, still a lot to cover. Uh, the Olympics are still going on with a lot of scandals with the Olympics. Uh, just <laughs> every time you turn on, you just you just can't make some of this stuff up. Their opening ceremony uh, was a mixture of a Greek and Roman Bacchanal showing the god of wine, Bacchus, in the middle of the Last Supper. And it was all men in drag. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. There are 2.4 billion Christians on this planet. And Paris, France, the opening ceremonies put a slap in every last one of their faces. The uproar on that opening ceremony. And you heard them do some sort of a half ass apology. But uh, we've got a, uh, a individual who identifies as a female, but has male chromosomes. And there are individuals, a very small minor, minority of them, I think it's not even 1% of 1%, are born what are known as hemphrodites, where the sexual organs do not match the chromosomes. 
So this person has the chromosomes of a male, the body strength of a man. And he entered the, the Olympics as a female. And his opponent, a young woman of, who worked hard to get as far as she could from Italy, lasted 46 seconds in the ring before he broke her nose. And she had to, she had to withdraw. That a man beats up a woman. Yep. And where's the uh, women's list? Where's the outrage? Where, where, where are they at? Well, we have a lot to talk about, a lot we're going to be going into. Um, we do start off each and every show with a dedication to a fallen hero. And today's dedication is going to go out to Independence Police Officer Cody Allen and court employee Drexel Mack. Their end of watch was Thursday, February 29th of twenty. 24. And here is the dedication. In the Kansas City suburb of Independence, Missouri, a procession of police officers escorted the body of one of their own to the medical examiner's office, the latest American police officer killed in the line of duty. Our thoughts and prayers are with all of the families and this entire community that has been devastated. The tragedy unfolded yesterday afternoon when a court employee tried to serve an eviction notice at this home. That's when police say someone inside opened fire, killing Drexel Mack, a civil process server in his early 40s. The suspect then opened fire on first responders, killing 35-year-old police officer Cody Allen, a father of two. Officer Cody Allen uh, served this community not once but twice um, as an independent police officer. He is a hero. The suspect was taken into custody with minor injuries. Investigators have not said what led up to the shooting, but our Kansas City affiliate, KMBC, reports the property had delinquent taxes with more than $28,000 due yesterday. The incident, similar to a recent shooting in Minnesota. Thousands gathered in the Minneapolis suburb of Burnsville Wednesday, paying their respects to two police officers and an EMS worker shot and killed while responding to a hostage situation on February 18th. The number of police officers shot on duty in the U.S. has hit a record high. 378 were shot last year. That's a 62% increase since 2018. Back in Missouri, the two other police officers who were shot are expected to survive. Police have not released any more details about the suspect. Andrew Dimbert, ABC News, New York. Yeah, she is outside the Independence Police Department for us tonight where... Many are paying tribute to both Allen and Mac as that memorial continues to grow. Chandler. Absolutely. There's three separate memorials right now. You just saw Officer Allen's car. And as we pan the camera, you can see flowers, candles, balloons, a flag and two crosses and so much more. We're learning more about both of those men who lost their lives. Speaking with Dwayne Day, who organized tonight's vigil, Drexel Mac was known as Big Mac. Officer Cody Allen was loving and loved being a father, building a racetrack in his backyard for his son, who had an electric car. The community response is overwhelming, way overwhelming. But this is how our community is. Tonight, the community gathering again outside the Independence Police Department to hold a candlelit vigil. Officer Cody Allen's car now sits out front and a memorial is growing. We're all just in shock, all of us. It's hard to process. Members of Officer Allen's family attended, including his cousin. Well, he's one of the good ones, you know, uh, the best man, the best dad. He was level headed. He was great to talk to if I had problems at home. I mean, he was just always there for everybody. So may Officer Allen and Mr. Mack rest in peace and may their legacies continue to inspire all of us. And now the community is there for Allen and Drexel Mack. You see it time and again in Independence that when tragedy st strikes, we come together and we care for each other. Becky Fight, a local business owner, says Independence is a close community and this tragedy has left many emotional. We have a lot of officers that come into our shop on a daily basis and they are not just numbers they're not just badge numbers to us they're people with families and we are so grateful for what they do fight says that she was approached by a friend at the independence police department to design a shirt for officer allen all the proceeds would be going towards a profit answering the call a charity 
for first responders. If you would like to buy a shirt, we do have a link up on our website right now. Reporting in Independence, Chandler Watkins, KCTV 5 News. He was one of the... Let it be said When we finished this race We kept them free We led with grace Let it be seen From sea to shine and sea Beautiful America Living our legacy Oh, Father Mother, sister, brother Oh, we gotta learn to love each other Oh, for the soul of the nation For oh, the next generation Let us be known As people
and we are back. You're here watching and listening to South and Sense live in half a dozen other places. I don't know yet. <laughs> I will get them put up on the homepage eventually. You can look at under archives. It'll show you where also the other places you can watch and listen to us either live or in the archives, as well as on our homepage. And people are on our homepage right now watching and listening and participating in the chat room, which is southernsense.net. Or if you have the old location, southern-sense.com, that brings you to the same place. So you can sit back and enjoy. I'm your hostess with the least mostest, the Radio Chickadee Annie, along with Curtis C.S. Bennett. Oh, man. Um, just before we went on to the uh, dedication, I pulled up some uh, articles last night as I was doing my notes for the show. And just before coming on air, I walked past the TV my husband's watching, and there's the acting director of the Secret Service, Roe, doing a public statement and announcement. I swear. Uh, and what was anyone... that announcement? Can anyone, he was given the timeline of the shooter. Okay. Um, claiming that uh, uh, the Secret Service didn't know that he was up on the roof until after the first shot was fired. I find that very hard to, to believe because I pulled up other timelines that show that there was a notification sent over to them. It was down a roundabout way because local uh, law enforcement didn't have direct communication with the Secret Service. Why? I don't know. Local Law enforcement offered to fly drones for them, and they told them, no, we don't need them. Why? Don't know. Hmm. Why was Secret Service inside the building with a four-degree uh, pitch and not on the roof itself? Well, we know that the Secret Service director told them, oh, it's too steep. Someone may hurt themselves, so you stay inside. Don't go on top. That's why she's no longer the director. But what I did find out, and I'm trying to get make sure this is correct, but what I have been told is the person that signed off on that assignment, that package they call it, uh, Secret Service, the equipment they needed, everything, was the acting director, Roe. Now, he's playing innocent, like, it's not my fault this happened. He's the acting director. He should have known everything that was going on. He was the second in command. You cannot turn around and say you don't know anything when you are the second in command. Well, it's already been established that they've known about the suspicious character for over 90 minutes. That's an hour and a half. And why nothing happened? Why they didn't, you know, have a lockdown and, and hold, you know, Trump back from coming on stage? You have to wonder, you know, that's why, it's, you know, a lot of people are quick to say, well, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I always learned that if it walk like a duck, quack like a duck, then maybe it's a duck. Sound like yeah. a setup to me. It's just, I mean, these are professionals, it's secret service. This isn't well, something that's new. They've been doing this for years and they lost a few and a few were shot, but survived like Reagan. So it's not like, you know, this would never happen the possibility so i don't well, know somebody let their guard down purposely I'm not, I'm not blaming the fill off you know agents well, there's, there's going to be there's going to be a full investigation especially if trump does win the white house but representative matt's matt waltz who's out of florida where you are uh told newsmax that he was concerned of possibility um may have had assistance these this guy cook may have had assistance it may have been someone else giving him a hand this will come out in the investigation whether or not this is true uh but there are some there are some questionings and he's saying i don't think we can rule out that he has had help talking about thomas michael crooks because of the sophisticated sophisticated tactics he was using including drone sur surveillance we know that he flew a drone he had multiple bombs on him with a remote detonator and a range headshot, finder. Yeah, a range finder and the headshot just narrowly missed President Trump. And I say, therefore the grace of God, he turned his head at that last second. And the funny part is is that the girl who put the display together, the the uh jumbotron or whatever he was looking at for the graphics and everything else, the young girl that did that, normally it would have been posted to his other side. He would not have turned his head to the right. He would have turned it to the left. 
And that would have been catastrophic. Everything was placed in a different location, so his movements were different. And just for the grace of God, for whatever happened, what caused that to be, made her do that. I'm saying the good Lord was there looking out for Donald J. Trump. Well, he mentioned that at that moment when he looked, he said he normally, you know, doesn't look at those charts, only rarely. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, he decided to look at it. Yeah. Yeah. And that That's made the difference. That made all the difference. But look what it exposed. Look what it exposed. Mm -hmm. the, the, the ineptitude. And it's not the men and women on the field. It's the higher ups, like associate uh, assistant deputy uh, director of Secret mm -hmm. Service Row. Look at the, the, the screw ups denying him the additional coverage and yet giving Jill Biden additional coverage. See, I don't think it was screw up. I think it was deliberate. And the, some of the That's people that he had on his team protecting him were not trained for that type of duty. And you know. Mm -hmm. When you train for something like this, you get a group and they train every day for hours a day. Everyone knows exactly where the other person is at all times. They know if X, Y, Z happens, you're doing A, B, C. Mm -hmm. You are a team and you act in concert. They're there going, what do we do? What happened? What do we do? I mean, if you know that Iran has put out a fatwa against the former president, why wouldn't you increase his security? It, it seemed like that'd be, that'd be a no-brainer. So they knew what they were doing. Yeah. And we have, we know known terrorists have crossed our border illegally. We know that for a fact. This is not like 9-11 hijackers where they came in on a visa and overstayed. These are people who deliberately snuck in to hide within our nation. And there are several people that are saying that there is going to be another attempt. Um, there is, let me see. There's a well, service agent was on Fox News. Let me see if I can find Well, him. he's made it known that he's going to return to Butler, Pennsylvania. Right. Right. Yeah. So there was a Secret Service agent that went on to Fox News and, and he said there will be a second attempt. There's no ands, ifs, or buts about it. So I think that's one of the reasons why they moved almost all of his rallies indoors. But but what's going to happen in Butler? That that makes me frightened to go back to that scene. It takes a lot of courage to do that. Oh, believe me, they'll have it on lockdown this time. <laughs> they're in enough trouble. I mean, they got caught. I mean, he was supposed to die. And because he didn't, you know, I think had Trump been assassinated, they would have tried to blame this all on that kid, Lone Wolf, just like Lee Harvey Oswald. Yeah. And just say, well, you know, there was some miscommunications, you know. But the thing is, Trump would have been out the way. Well, um, a Secret Service sniper sent a letter to the Secret Service Uniform Division. Uh, and this, this guy was a sniper himself. He said the agency needs to change. If not now, when? The next assassination attempt in 30 days, read the letter. We all should expect another attempt to happen before November. We've exposed our inability to protect our leaders due to our leadership. The unnamed cypher said high-level supervisors should resign in the wake of the assassination attempt. Sadly, we have fallen short for years. We just got lucky and looked good doing it. I've conveyed these thoughts not only to supervisors, only to be brushed off as those with less experience somehow know more than me. This sniper is a veteran of the Marine Corps and a member of the Secret Service counter sniper team. And he said, July 13th was a stain I will never be able to cleanse. Wow. What was the date? July what? July 13th was the date that Trump was shot. That wasn't a Friday, was it? <laughs> <laughs> I have to look into that. Oh, man. And, you know, um, Camilla Harris is now the de facto nominee, even though she hasn't gone to the convention. Um, they haven't had the convention yet, which will be coming up next week. Um, 
looks like she's raking in a lot of money. Um, there's some questions about the 96 million that came out of Joe Biden's pack, which is going forward to the uh, FEC for ethics investigation for violations. Um, but Trump showed up at the National Association of Black Journalists uh, in Chicago just the other day. And he got there, he was invited, and so was Kamala Harris. Well, Kamala Harris decided she had something else to do that day and ducked, and she didn't show up. Trump did. He gets there, they have him waiting for 35 minutes. He was, his, he was scheduled X, Y, Z, without a reason, without saying, oh, I'm sorry, we're running behind, blah, 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 some sort of excuse, nothing. He gets on stage and there's three women Harris Faulkner is one of them with Fox News. She's the Fox News religious reporter, or she was. I don't know what she, her role is now there, since I haven't watched in a while. And there are two other women. And this one first woman starts off with a 15-minute long question, rather aggressively. It doesn't say, good afternoon, Mr. Trump, you know. Pleasure to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Um, we have a couple of questions we'd like to raise. And start in but or no, even she, apologize for being 35 minutes late yeah she goes straight into attack mode and donald trump slapped back he said no i'm not sitting here taking this first off you're rude which was true secondly you made me wait without a reason which is true and thirdly uh we'll pull up the tapes uh but we saw them on fox news on newsmax and several other uh news media outlets playing the stuff that she always identified as Indian, Indian American, Caribbean Indian, but never as black. And now suddenly she here is the vice president and everyone's saying, oh, she's always claimed she's black. No, go back to the tapes. She wasn't the drug czar. Go, oh, no, she was the drug czar. Go back to the tapes from the day when Biden announced her being the drug czar. That was her job to secure the border. It was her job that was what was needed was on the border to protect this nation. And she didn't do anything. And then she says in her last rally that, hey, hey I, I know the job. I mean, I have a record to stand on. What record? You left the border open. What record? You sent more black men to prison than your predecessors. What record? What have you done on merit? Good question, right? She has no response for anything that she, you know, can say, this is my accomplishment as VP or really anything. So they had to go way, way back to, to when she was an attorney, I believe, to, to kind of like bring up some positive accomplishments. Um, and basically that's just her being a female that made it as an attorney. I heard she had had to struggle to become, you know, an attorney, you know, passing the bar and whatnot. But, you know, after that, she, she ascended and how she ascended is questionable. <laughs> some people have their opinion of how she got as far as she did. But anyway, you know, they're going to try to um, make her look like the next, you know, coming of um, Mahatma Gandhi, you know, the savior of the black race or whatever, and how she's been down with the struggle. Mm -hmm. But um, it's just saying so. But uh, what gets me is like she says she's going to defend the Second Amendment, but she's going to ban assault weapons. I Give me a definition of assault weapon, Camila. Because I'm sure you don't know what the definition is. Hmm. Any weapon that fires around technically is an assault weapon. A hammer is assault weapon. A knife is an assault weapon. You're going to ban assault weapons. Where do you end? Where do you end? Yeah, that term is something that was made up. Like you say, any weapon, uh, a, a toothpick. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> try to stab you with a toothpick. That's an assault <laughs> weapon. No, it's... I, I, it's amazing that this woman has gotten as far as she has. And traditionally, the job of vice president was a dead-end job. It wasn't until Teddy Roosevelt 
ran and won the presidency, that it stopped being a dead end job. But they want her to be annoyed at the next coming. And I think America's starting to wake up. Uh, she had a great blast of numbers when she first announced, but now it's starting to peak and people are starting to look under the covers and say, oh, maybe everything isn't as kosher as it should be. With that said, let's segue into our next, next segment of the show and want to welcome back to the show, as I say it again, the one, the only, John O'Connor. Good afternoon, John. How are you today? Hey, John. And you've got yourself a new podcast, I hear. Let me see if I can get my notes here correctly. And it is called... <laughs> Oh, we go. The Mysteries of Watergate podcast. Uh, where can people find that? Well, I would say for uh, your uh, viewers to um, go to my website, postgatebook.com. I've got my book Postgate on there and the book Mysteries of Watergate. And I also have a tab so that you can push to get the podcast. But they all fit together because what they really tell you, Annie, is uh, how much we were lied to during Watergate. And no matter how many peccadillos Nixon may have committed, uh, the whole the truth was really buried. And the guy got drummed out of office for stuff that presidents do quite frequently. Uh, it's really a shame. But that started our whole modern uh, mainstream media as a, a partisan player in the market. They were never a political power as they were since Watergate. And now look at what's happening today. So postgatebook.com will get you there. That's why I wrote it. I, you know, if, if you want to make a, a, a small fortune writing, start out with a big fortune. <laughs> you know, that's funny because I started a book something like but 10 or 12 years ago. <laughs> it's sitting in little scattered pieces, little recording here, a little recording there. <laughs> One of these days, when I'm in my rocking chair and in my 90s, I'll finally get the book out called In Life, There Must Be Love and Laughter. Or Why Is There a Hard-Boiled Egg in the Middle of My Living Room Floor? <laughs> I can't wait to hear it, to read that one. <laughs> Me too. Man, I don't even know where to start. I mean, right now, a drug, Trump has had that gag order. We thought it was lifted in New York. But now it's back on again. What is going on in New York City with this court case? Well, that's the last defense of the Trump lawfare, Annie, because that's the only one that no one has been able to touch. Uh, the federal cases are basically in orbit now. Uh, you've got this Jack Smith thing killing the Mar-a-Lago one. Uh, uh, Judge Chutkin, who would love to Chutkin, who would love to get Trump in the January 6th case has got to go through this whole immunity analysis, which then will get appealed. So we're not going to see that one for a long time. Who knows what's happening with Fannie Willis in Georgia? So what we've got left after all this Sturm and Drang of uh, how terrible Trump is, we've got a terrible prosecution in New York uh, with this judge. And what he intends to do, and the reason he's silencing him, is because what he intends to do is when the sentencing does come up, which he continued, and I think he did it so he would have maximum impact on the presidential race. I think if I had a few dollars to bet, I would bet that what he does is it's early September, I think he's gonna sentence him. He's gonna send him to Rikers Island forthwith. That is to say, I hope you got your toothbrush, President Trump, because I'm remanding you to custody right now and you're going to Rikers. Now, it's going to take him a few days to get a stay on that, to go to the Court of Appeals and say, wait a second, come on, we want to stay pending appeal. There are a host of issues here. You usually, if there's a valid or colorable appeal, usually a court will not make a person serve time. And again, he can still stay on bail. He can have, uh, you know, report to the probation office to make sure he's still in the country. And I don't think anybody's going <laughs> to. Donald Trump's not going to hide any place. It's not his Where nature. in the world no, no. is Donald Trump? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Exactly, CS. It's kind of like, you know, uh, you know, there's one person I always know where he is. You know, I kind of can keep track of him better than my wife, you know, who's off <laughs> buying things, you know. But Trump, I know where he is. Uh, so. Uh, so that's what's going to happen, and it's going to be kind of a, a once again, uh, a partisan mess, because this guy is, 
I've read, uh, by the way, I have the instructions right here. I used to carry them around in my briefcase. Those are the worst criminal instructions I've ever seen in my life. If I were a juror in the New York case, I would have to find Trump guilty the way it was all presented. Mm -hmm. And I think they thought they were going through the jurors in good faith, thought they were going through this cool legal process. Oh, there's some instructions and so forth. But, you know, he made a virtue of necessity. That is to say, if you find X, Y and Z, which clearly happened, but which have nothing to do with criminal liability, well, then you have to find that this is a criminal, uh, this is a crime. Uh, so that was just the worst kangaroo court thing I've ever seen. And, you know, I've seen some bad cases, you know, they're bad. Judges in good faith make mistakes. This is not a judge acting in good faith and making mistakes. This mm -hmm. is not it at all, and it's not even close. Now, I know judges will often favor one side, and they'll mm -hmm. give one side that he favors the breaks. This isn't that kind of case. This is not the normal case in which the judge hates you and likes your opponent, you know, and you're not getting the rulings you want. No, that's not it. This is way, 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 way beyond the normal. So uh, I, I'm a very much an admirer of our judges in the country. And normally you get something of a fair shake. Sometimes you get a little bad. Sometimes you get a little better than you deserve. Sometimes a little worse, but not like this, not like this. So, Annie, we got a real problem here with our system. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, I used to work in New York City and um, going before certain judges, you're giving testimony. And the second you start giving testimony, you know, uh, judge is not liking what I'm saying. But most of the time, I judges loved me. But when I got up there to testify, especially if I, if I was in civilian clothes <laughs> and the defense defense tries to twist my words and judge would look at them and go, leave the young lady alone. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, I testify a lot today, Annie, as an expert witness. I know exactly what you're talking about. I'm probably going to be testifying here in a couple of days in Los Angeles. But, uh, you know, you, you want and most judges are very courteous to witnesses, even if they're given the lawyer a little little uh, nudges here and there. They're usually very, very courteous to people who take their time out to come into court and raise their right hand and tell the truth. And, and I, I, I really like that. Yeah. Well, we see now what Judge Aline Cannon did in turning around saying there's no grounds for this case and then challenging whether or not Jack Smith was properly appointed as a uh, as a prosecutor, special prosecutor. You know, go over the audience what her train of thought was with Jack Smith. Well, here you go. Jack Smith was appointed as a special counsel by Merrick Garland. Now, a special counsel is one that's outside of the Justice Department, the regular routine of Justice Department prosecutions. There's nothing wrong with a special counsel appointment. Usually there is a conflict. That is to say, you know, for instance, as in Watergate, when you had the attorney general, Nixon's attorney general, perhaps in, in, implicated. So you, you say, well, if there's a conflict, even if it's a spiritual conflict, you hire a special counsel to handle this as a because he's independent. Now, here's the problem. The Constitution, this little problem of the Constitution says that if you have an officer of the United States, that has to be somebody that's appointed by the president with the advice and consent of the Senate. Now, you think about it. If not, if not, people can come in and spend your tax dollars, get you in a war, whatever, and nobody's confirmed them. So you have to confirm them. It's in a big deal. If you remember the Supreme Court justice nominee, Robert Bork, was not confirmed in a very, very uh, contentious set of hearings. And that was important because he couldn't serve. He couldn't uh, exercise the duties and roles of an attorney general without, you know, without confirmation. I'm sorry, Supreme Court judge in that case. But here we have Jack Smith being appointed He's a private citizen. He's not a U.S. attorney. He hasn't been confirmed by the Senate. And yet he is exercising the plenary powers of the Justice Department. Very important. And doing so against the former president. You can't get more important and, and substantial than what he was doing. So to say that he, who is exercising all the powers of our Justice Department, without appointment by the Senate, 
just violates the plain wording of the Constitution. Now, let me add for your your viewers here, when uh, John Durham is appointed, for example, or back in the Scooter Libby days, Patrick Fitzgerald, or there's another referral to a guy named Huber out of Utah for, for some such, they, they're all sitting U.S. attorneys who have been confirmed by uh, the Senate. So in those cases, you have a special counsel. He's independent. He's a little bit walled off in his decision making from the Justice Department, but he is appointed and confirmed by the Senate. Jack Smith is a guy off the street who, and, and here's where the justice comes in. This is like a Shakespearean tragedy because the guilt of Garland was what spurred this appointment. He was not required by conflict principles to hire a special counsel. Why did he do so? He did so for the sake of appearance. So he can be St. Merrick, even though everybody knows he's doing this at Biden's bidding. Mm -hmm. The leaks out of the White House were numerous that Biden was going on a tirade about getting Trump an indictment. So Garland knew guiltily that he was carrying out these uh, nasty uh, uh, assignments by the president. So he made it look like he's he's washing his hands by giving it to good old Jack Smith, who he knows is a bulldog that's ready to go get Trump come hell or high water. That's his style. He never quits. He, he really lacks, by the way, Smith, by the way, lacks judgment. And that's his nature. What a, what a guy to give it to when you want to get Trump, get a guy that's a bulldog and lacks judgment. So uh, he did that. And now it's coming back to him. His chickens are coming home to roost. He tried to act like he was lofty and independent. And he's just this, oh, Merrick Garland is a guy that's just right down the middle. No, he's not. He's a partisan. And and now you look back at his appointment, almost appointment to the Supreme Court. Everybody was saying on the Democratic side, oh, Merrick Garland is the most Simon pure down the middle guy ever. He just calls balls and strikes. No, he's not John Roberts. He's not that kind of guy. Uh, he's he's a guy who is a partisan. And if he got on that court, you know, you would just have hell to pay. He's a smart enough guy. So it's interesting, Annie, that in CS that he comes out and says, oh, do I look like I'm stupid? I'm a sitting federal <laughs> judge for 20 years. How could I make this mistake? And my response to that is you've been a sitting judge for 20 years. How did you make that mistake? And the, the reason is, is he was. He, he, the other Shakespearean problem of pride, he thought he could just waltz through this. He knew that the D.C. Circuit had uh, rejected the same challenge in one of Bob Mueller's cases where he uh, uh, involving a subpoena where the subpoenaed guy challenged Mueller's authority. Uh, but it was the D.C. Circuit, which is full of people like Merrick Garland that are partisans and Democrat, very strongly Democratic. So he relied on that, but he did not rely on the actual wording of the Constitution in which a third grader could figure out that you're supposed to be confirmed by the, with the advice and consent of the Senate. It's right there. It's plain English. There's nothing obscure or arcane about it, Annie and CS. So we've got a, we've got a funny deal here. And I think his, he's red-faced because this, this Mar-a-Lago case was the case that because and he'd, he'd worked with the archives to set this up to set Trump up, he did have eight felonies here that he could have that he could have won fair and square, uh, and I've said that this was his dangerous case. Trump, you know, it looks like he lied and obstructed rela relating to whether or not he'd handed over all the documents, uh, and um, uh, uh, he that, that he he lied. Uh, regarding handing over the documents. That was a setup. And they set it up as a criminal referral rather than a civil case. Because if you had done the same thing in a civil case, this happens all the time. I mean, I have a civil case. I mean, and people don't produce all the documents you ask them for. And then sometimes you got to go back and ask the judge again. I don't think my opponent gave me all the documents. Well, judge, judge will say, well, go back and look again. Okay, because I'm warning you, Mr. Opponent Lawyer, if you don't do it, I'm going to start thinking about sanctioning you. Well, that's what Trump did. Trump didn't give all the documents. But in a criminal case, that becomes obstruction. 
it becomes lying. And, mm-hmm. and, uh, and, and Garland, set him, Garland set him up for that. So the interesting thing about it is his pride and his deceptiveness in setting up this charade of a special counsel have come back to bite him and good good for there, there's a certain justice in it even though trump really <laughs> is getting well, away with eight crimes but but you see now what happened was it's the fruit of the poisonous tree because merrick garland did not then have the, not third merrick garland, uh, jack smith did not have the authority to do the search warrants so if he didn't have the authority for the search warrants the search warrants are in value so any evidence they get at that point is going to be invalid because it was an invalid search warrant fruit of the poisonous tree right you know, you're right, and I hadn't thought about this. And if Jack Smith was appointed before that search warrant, I agree with you. Uh, I, I don't know when he was appointed. That's my only thought. I haven't thought about that, but I'm going to look that up when, when you get off as to when he was appointed. But if he was appointed by then, it would be fruit of the poisonous tree. But let's even assume for purposes of argument that he wasn't appointed then. Still, he indicted. He was appointed when there when there was an indictment. We know that. Now I may I may be off on when he was appointed. I don't know. I just don't know. I'm I'm, I'm ignorant of it I, until you brought it up. I hadn't thought about it. Uh, but but certainly the indictment was uh, basically tainted, and the grand jury proceedings were tainted because you might as well have had a guy, you know, down the street. Uh, you might as well have had Taylor Swift do this, and she would have been. Uh, more mm-hmm. popular with me if she had done it rather than Jack Smith. Hmm. John, I have to be leaving in a few minutes. I got an event to speak at, but wasn't it all along the end game of the left to um, have the former president be labeled a convicted felon? I mean, er- everywhere he goes, and he's facing a left type uh, audience or interviewer. They say convicted felon, you know, he's a convicted felon. Now, if they can get him in jail, that's the icing on the cake. But they were hoping, I I believe they were hoping that being a convicted felon would tarnish his his image going into the elections. Absolutely, CS, that's exactly what they wanted because Biden knew he was in trouble. And he started railing about indicting Trump later in his term when he was thinking about reelection, realizing he was not doing well. He had to do this. And it's interesting, the mainstream media, although they didn't blare it dramatically, there would be leaks out of the White House that they would report that talked about how Biden was yelling and screaming about getting Trump. He needed it. He needed to call him a convicted felon, because really, this is all about the way you get Trump is not on his policies. I mean, who can argue? I mean, is anybody going to come up and say, gee, I think I think Trump closing the border is a bad thing. Oh, gee, I think uh, low taxes <laughs> are bad or pumping for oil is bad. Not most people don't think that most people agree with Trump on policies. The way they've always been able to get him is by calling him Hitler, you know, and thus a bullet into his ear. But they need to demonize him. And you're absolutely right. Uh, as soon as he got convicted, Biden started calling him a convicted felon. And everyone says, oh, we don't want someone like this. Our little kids, do we want a convicted felon as an example for our children? It's so bad, our world image. Uh, What a terrible guy. And of course, that felony is no more a felony than spitting on the sidewalk. You know, it is terrible. It is just terrible. I mean, the depth of how silly that is. But but they but Judge Marchand, whose daughter raises money to, uh, you know, on the strength of this. And Marchand himself is in some special groups that were targeting Trump. You couldn't ask for a better judge for the purposes of of of, of a uh, you know, of a kangaroo court. I mean, he was terrible. He was just terrible. And I think he uh, campaigned to get the cases. He was not in a, I think he was an appointed judge, not an elected one. Well, Mar-a-Lago was raided on August of 22. Uh, Jack Smith was appointed November of 22. There you are. I feel better about it, Annie. I'm, I'm happy. I, now I don't feel so bad for missing the idea, the question, because I should have, <laughs> I should have researched that question myself, you know. Because so I, but but that's oh, good to know. But that's what? that makes sense. And remember this: the way this thing was set up, 
was really weird because uh, the archives, after they got the original tranche of Trump stuff, they sent this weird, the archives had a White House liaison. So they were working with Biden in coming up with a letter that they in turn sent to the FBI saying, oh my gosh, these documents we got, there were some classified records that were touching unclassified records in the same box. Oh, horrors. Well, who says there's anything wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that. It happens all the time. You often get three pages of classified stuff surrounding 20 that aren't classified. So this was what started the criminal case. Well, I want to say, well, wait a second. I'm a former prosecutor, federal prosecutor. You don't open up a case because one classified document touches another, but that's what they did. So they opened it up. And now that they opened it up, rather than having a civil subpoena or a civil case in which you're trying to get the same documents from Trump, which you can do all day, they now made it into a criminal matter. They're asking for the same documents they would in a civil matter. But if you if you mess up on a criminal subpoena, they can say, oh, you lied, you obstructed, blah, 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 blah. And that's the difference between a civil case and a criminal case. And so this whole thing has been a setup from day one. Uh, the archives were involved in it. And most people don't realize that Trump was in negotiation with the archives. And he said, look, I'll give you all these documents, but I want to make sure you're going to give me access to them, aren't you? And the archives said, no, we're not going to give you access to your Russiagate documents. But if you look at the Presidential Records Act, which controls here, a president has absolute right to work with to the exclusion of everybody else in the world, to go look at his documents classified and otherwise afterwards. Obama still has control over six million <laughs> documents from his presidency mm -hmm. in a warehouse. And I don't object to that. I mean, he's doing all kinds of stuff. He's digitizing them and blah, blah, blah. And as to, un as to classified documents, Obama can go to a skiff and look at them to his heart's content. That's all Trump wanted. But the archives said no. Now what happens is now Trump is incentivized to say, now that the archives is not doing its duty, he's not going to allow him access to his own documents, which is horrendous. Now what's Trump do? Now Trump tries to keep a few that he really wants. And they knew that. They knew that Trump wanted these documents. He, he'd negotiated with them. He said, let me see my Russiagate documents. Now what he's doing is uh, now they come up and they want uh, they have a criminal subpoena and they want these documents. Now he's trying to hide a few key juicy Russiagate documents because he'd been the subject of a of a ridiculous uh, claim engineered by the Justice Department. These people all knew this was phony. They knew that there was no Russiagate mm -hmm. thing. Uh, that was mm -hmm. just obvious. And, and, and it's the same thing CS is talking about. You know, uh, now they want him to be a convicted felon back then. Same thing with Russiagate. They wanted to be a Russian spy. And all of it is cooked up. I mean, I'd love to say otherwise. I'd love to I'd be the first guy to say Trump's terrible. He's never been my cup of tea. But darn, you got to vote for this guy. <laughs> you got no choice, do you? Mm -hmm. You know, if, if Trump says something that makes me wince every now and then, so what? I mean, actually, I think he's kind of a funny guy, and and I enjoy hearing him. But I, sometimes I say, no, don't, no, don't say that, Donald. Please, please, you know. Uh, but uh, they've 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 tried to make a guy that is a blustering real estate agent that's very bull in a china shop. They're trying to make him into a Hitler. Well, he's not. He's a he's a blustering bull in a china shop guy who has a strong will and gets done what he needs to get done that the people voted him in for. It's kind of like democracy. How about that? And think okay. about it. Andrew Jackson. The Democrats love Andrew Jackson. We used to have Andrew Jackson Day, Jefferson Jackson Day. And of course, both of them were slave owners. Oh, we're the greatest pillars of the Democratic community. But Andrew Jackson was a guy who flouted everything and talked very roughly and was rough on the Supreme Court and said, okay, they've made their ruling. Now let's see them enforce it. So that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. And it's okay for Obama to say, I have a pen and a phone. I don't care about what democracy demands that I do. That's okay when they do it. When Trump says things that are just a little rough and crude, they try to make a mountain out of molehill and say he's Hitler. Well, he's not Hitler. 
And, you know, and, 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 uh, but, but that's where it gets back to the media, uh, you know, and, and the way he's portrayed for people who are low information voters. Well, you saw all this coming with Watergate, how the media <laughs> twisted everything around. <laughs> all right, Curtis, uh, enjoy your, your, um, what, uh, Speaking our, events. Our, yes, thank you very much. I we brain fart. We can be heroes. We can be heroes <laughs> foundation.org where Roger Stone and Laura Loomer will be joining you on stage in your uh, speech. Okay. Well, good luck. Nice talk to you, John. Nice take, talking get to you, pictures. Take care. <laughs> okay. Yeah, there's a foundation in Florida, Woman Runs, We Can Be Heroes Foundation.org that deal with um, law enforcement, first responders, and uh, military veterans and help them in, integrate into society, food, jobs, and things like that. So they have an event that uh, Roger Stone speaking at, Laura Loomer and uh, Curtis C.S. Bennett. Oh, fun. Good. Good, good. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, looking at all the stuff that's been happening to Trump and the way the media has been waylaying him, um, we were discussing before you came on what happened at the, uh, the National Association of Black Journalists with the three ladies that waylaid him on the stage. Now, you can't say Paris Faulkner because she's with Fox News and I didn't hear her ask any questions, but it was the first one that asked. And I mean, just sucker punched him. And I guess this is this is now the new media we have. It gets worse and worse. And because there is no criticism among the main people, they get away with things that are just terrible. Uh, it, yeah, yeah. It's Trevor, uh, you know, it's kind of like, when did you stop beating your wife? I mean, classic, classic uh, questions. For example, in this case, the question was, was, do you think, Kamala Harris was a DEI hire. Well, you know, I'm a lawyer, you know, and so I would come up with the right answer, which is, I don't have to say that. Biden said it. He said and bragged that she was a DEI hire. So let that speak for what it is. Um, but, but of course, what I liked about what he did was he basically did not sit still for the nasty tone. Yeah. He came right out and said, you're, you, you know, you're, you're just talking in such a nasty tone. You hit me with this right away, which is really, it, it's, it's really not a question. It's an accusation is what it is. And, uh, and so that's, that's the thing. And that, that's the classic uh, idea of taking any kind of wrong that's been said by anybody in the world. And what you do is you say to the conservative person, are you going to denounce that? Why haven't you denounced that? And there's something bad happened. And why are you going to denounce it? You know, progressives don't have to denounce anything anybody else has done, uh, you know, and uh, so forth. But but Trump, to his credit, came back at her. I wish he would have been a little smoother in his response that, you know, really Biden has been calling. He bragged. I think there's this, a clip out there about him bragging about his DEI hires and how she's the greatest example of it, because at the very top of the heap, vice president, the, the highest DEI hire he could make, it's a DEI hire. And I think that people should be really offended by that. And the mainstream media should be offended by the whole notion. What if I said, and this is what's so problematic. We studied this a lot when I was in law school, this benign discrimination. What happens if I say, gee, I really am going to have a good cabinet because I'm going to have as many white males as I can possibly muster. And boy, look at this. They're all white males, you know, and they're all over six feet tall. And isn't that great? Well, everybody would say, what kind of a racist and sexist are you that you think that's okay? But if you say, I need a woman, and I need a black woman or other minority. Why aren't you racist and sexist? I think you are racist and sexist. You can say you're benignly so, but in other people's eyes, maybe you're not so benignly so. If you're a white male, aren't you born an American citizen? Aren't you a, a, a creature of God? Uh, don't you have natural rights, inalienable rights guaranteed you? Why should you be treated second class? And why should Joe Biden and Kamala Harris preach these uh, these sessions, these uh, white supremacy sessions where everybody has to say I'm guilty because I'm white? 
do we go around? Should we go around and say I'm guilty because I'm black? Oh, no, nobody would say that, you know. Uh, so it's it's be, what we're doing is, is we're going from liberalism, which in my own way I am, and most conservatives are, they don't know it. Conservatives want to conserve liberalism. That is to say we have a liberal republic with free speech, free markets, free ideas. Classical uh, liberal. Do, what and, is known as the classical liberal. Right. Classic liberal. Conservatives are trying to preserve the classic liberalism on which our country was based. And, 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 and in contradistinction to the French uh, type of liberalism, which went too far, it's really the fore, forerunner of progressivism, in which Rousseau says, if you don't go along with the general will, we will force you to be free. Well, what happens is now what we don't have liberalism anymore. We have progressivism where we are all, all are being forced to be free. Oh, I thought I had the right to buy any kind of stove I want. No, you don't. You can't buy a gas stove. And I thought I had the right to buy an internal combustion engine. No, you don't. Uh, you know, I thought I had the right to give my opinions about just about anything. No, you don't. You have to have the right opinions and we're going to monitor your speech. And if you don't speak the right way, we're going to have the FBI investigate you. Oh, you're a Roman Catholic. Oh, wait a sec. I'm, I'm, I'm going to look at my list. Uh, let me let me investigate you. So we are going to illiberalism. It's a tremendous illiberalism, uh, Annie. Uh, and it is and it is very close. The interesting thing about it is, you know, the forerunners of all this were the most authoritarian regimes on earth. Uh, this kind of stuff you see in Russia, Iran, you name every authoritarian regime, that's what they do. Well, John, I've got my next guest in the batter box and it's Peter Navarro. So oh. we're gonna have a, <laughs> do you wanna say hi to great. him? Oh, great, Peter's a great guy. Can I say hi to him? Yeah, yes, you can. Peter, I have a friend of yours here who wants to say hi. Hey, John O'Connor, what's up, my brother? What's going on? Listen, keep up keeping up there, uh, uh, Peter, uh, I think you're a great hero of mine, and and you know if uh, if they convict you of not being nice to the legislature, uh, you know, uh, you know you're my hero. I appreciate that. The Constitution is a terrible thing to try to destroy, so I stood up for it, paid a price, but it was worth it. What the heck, the separation of power stuff, Peter? What the heck? But listen. Good. I just wanted to say hi to you. I really am Good. a big fan and, and uh, I keep going here. Okay. All right, my brother. Okay. <laughs> right. Thank Take you. Care. John. God bless. All right. Check out John's podcast, uh, which is, I know I'm going to screw it up again. Uh, the mysteries of Watergate podcast. Check it out. And now we've got our friend, Peter Navarro. I'm my Paisano. <laughs> Was happy to see you out. And I saw you on stage at the convention and you had me in tears. And what a lovely fiance you have. Don't let that woman get away from you, Peter. Don't let her get away. Yes, that's my sweetheart. Hey, by the way, I'm looking at your Chiron here, just so people don't get confused. It should be uh, substack.com forward slash Navarro. Oh, not Peter Navarro? Navarro. It's, it's like wrong. But okay. really, what? Yeah. So I don't know how that got there. It should be. Um, oh, that's easy to fix. Dot com forward slash Navarro. That's it. I don't know where that'll go with the with the yep. app. It's confusing that's... social media with. Oh, there we go. How's that? I will not let my girl go. Uh, <laughs> I went to prison, so you don't have to. Was the theme of that speech? I was trying to explain that when you give power to a Democrat elite that will abuse that power and you let them control all three branches of government, they'll put like me and Steve Bannon in prison. They're going to try to put, uh, they will put Donald Trump in prison if he loses this election. And um, what I'm trying to do now between now and election day is I got this, uh, you got it posted there, the new MAGA deal. It's my new book. It's Don Jr.'s publishing house called New Maga Deal. It's all, you can get it at newmagadeal.com or Amazon. Here's why I think uh, this book's important, by why I really want to talk about it. We've got a new <laughs> opponent in the presidential <laughs> race. Is that what we want to call her? <laughs> they switch, as it were, 
Uh, nobody should have been surprised by it. I certainly wasn't. I wrote an article for the Washington Times back in January that said Biden would not be the nominee and he would be switched right before their convention. And uh, sometimes I hate to be right. But here's the thing. We're making we're making a fundamental mistake early, clutching our pearls, seeing the polls tighten and just going after her with these personal attacks. That That's that's not going to work. We've got an election where 90 percent of the people's minds are already made up. Our base in MAGA is impregnable. They can say anything they want about Trump or any of us. And and those people are going to go to the polls and support Trump. A lot of the the the, the radical Democrat part of the Democrat base is, is made up. And what we really have to do to win the election in November for Donald Trump is we've got to appeal to women. We've got to appeal to black, brown and blue collar Americans. Those are the two core constituencies uh, of the Democrat elite base, which are up for grabs. And you can't yeah, look. It's it's a Mars and Venus world when you attack Kamala Harris personally, you know, the, the, the DEI thing, the affairs she had, we will, it, it just, women just, I mean, you're a woman, you tell me if I'm wrong, it just turns women off. What we need to do is hit her on policy. If you think about this, Ann, the six major policies that Americans t- are telling pollsters are going to decide their vote, we win on every single one of them. If you look at inflation in the economy, Trump is strongly preferred by double digits. And Kamala Harris has embraced Bidenomics, so she owns that. Kamala Harris on the border, she was supposed to be the border czar and she turned her back on that. Trump wins on border security by double digits. Foreign policy, Kamala Harris. Look, of all the candidates for president that we've had, and ever since I can remember, and it goes back a long ways, she has the least foreign policy experience of anybody I know. We got crises in the Ukraine and Israel. We got communist China screwing around in the Taiwan Strait. These are dangerous times. The rocket man shooting off his North Korean Roman candles again. We went on that. Kamala Harris is the defund the police queen. We went on crime. Kamala Harris, particularly in Pennsylvania, is you're not going to be fracking anymore. Pennsylvania's economy significantly depends on fracking. And all this woke stuff, even mainstream Democrats, women do not support men being able to go and knock women out in an Olympic ring or participate in soccer or whatever here and take scholarships away from young girls. So here's a thought. This is the first day of the rest of the campaign. Why not just beat her on policy? And by the way, I think she's more easy to beat than Joe Biden for one particular reason. Biden had this 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 myth, which was false, but but he pulled it off that he was the kid from Scranton and somehow he appealed to uh, working class Americans. I mean, he never backed it up with any policies. Kamala doesn't have that. She's the most liberal senator in the Senate when she was there, and she's associated with the California globalization and kind of the elites, the wine drinking crew. I mean, look, this is this. It won't be easy, never be easy, but it's it's sure better to attack her on policy. And that's where the new MAGA deal comes in. 100 actions in 100 days. Talk about the economy, border security, foreign policy, the weaponization of the government, law and order in the cities and all this woke stuff. It's written not just by me, but we've got a forwards by Steve Bannon, and we've got contributions from former Trump officials like Rick Grinnell and Russ Vogt and David Bernhardt, who was the Secretary of the Interior. And that's my mission between now and November. Get the secular gospel of Trump policy preached 
to swing voters, independents, Democrat, part of the base that, and here's one line I would have loved to have been able to say, but it got cut at the RNC. I want to appeal to every Democrat. Think about this. Disengage from, disenfranchised by, or disgusted with the radical left turn that the elites controlling the party have taken the Democrats. That's where we need to be. Yeah, it's 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 not the the Democratic Party of our grandparents, to be quite honestly. It's yeah. it's not the working man's party. It's not the everyday blue collar party. Now I do a podcast with the county the county GOP chair in El Paso, Colorado. That was the heart of where the Democrats tried to take Trump off the uh, the the ballot, and she was in the heart of that. And when we do our show, our last Wednesday, the question was brought to us. What do you think the message should be? And the first words out of my mouth was, it's the economy, stupid. Yes. You want to win Americans over, hit them in the wallet, hit them in the pocketbook, and are you better off than four years ago? It's the inflation, stupid, too. Yes. I mean, we have the, uh, I mean, just today, we're seeing the jobs report come in soft. We're seeing the stock market turn over and get into bear market territory. It's already there in places like Japan. Kamala Harris owns all this. Mm -hmm. Full-throated support of Bidenomics. She was supposed to be the border czar, but said it was not her job. It was the only thing Joe Biden ever tried to give her, and she turned that down. Foreign policy, she's the river to the sea, pro-Palestinian uh presidential candidate and she can go ahead and try to make josh shapiro an orthodox jew her vice president pick and 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 try to kind of like portray and win back jewish americans but look jewish americans let me just speak to you for a minute why do you keep voting for Democrats, going back to Obama, who hate Israel. Uh, Trump was the guy who put the embassy in Jerusalem. Obama, Biden, now Harris. They don't even want to talk to Netanyahu. (laughs) Harris gets on there and goes, well, we want peace. We We want a ceasefire. We want kumbaya. It's like, hey, There's thousands of miles of tunnels underneath Gaza that Hamas uses to launch raids on innocent people in Israel. You can't let that stay there. You got to get rid of those tunnels in Hamas before you can even think about things like a ceasefire. Kamala Harris doesn't even understand that. So why not go after her for her policies and her ignorance on policies. Well, I got to tell you, because coming out of NYPD, I was in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, and one day I'm out there on patrol, and there's the Berend rabbi, and Chuck Schumer was doing his little tour around there just before he became senator, running for votes. And I asked the grand rabbi, why are you supporting him when he does not support Israel, even though he is Jewish? Oh, he goes, you don't understand. This is the thing. I says, I understand if he's not going to support your homeland, which is also his homeland. So why vote for him? And I could never understand why they vote exactly the opposite way that would help them. I don't get it. I, I, I I mean, I'm too, but this, if there's anything that's a turning point for Jewish Americans, it has got to be what is happening now in Israel, in Gaza, in Iran. And look, this is an existential threat to Israel. I mean, they, they're faced now with Hezbollah in Lebanon. They're going to open fronts, some multi-war fronts. And Kamala Harris isn't going to help help them. And, and she doesn't have the kind of clout that Donald Trump has to stop Iran Stop Russia and the Ukraine from doing what they're doing. If Trump were in there, we wouldn't even be talking about this. No, 
No, we wouldn't be. We wouldn't even be talking about this. We would not be seeing the, the marches through the streets of D.C. and New York and other major cities of these students united for infatata. I'm sorry. You wouldn't be seeing the anti-Semitic instances in our colleges and on our streets. We wouldn't be seeing this if we had Trump back there because they have no control over the progressive left message. They're just the puppets there. I, uh, you know, it's like I point this way, right? Behind the flag, right? It's about a mile and a half that way. Union Station, where where the river oh, yeah. to the sea, mass bandits there, defacing a statue with paint that will never come out. That stuff doesn't come out. You can scrub it all you want. And I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute. Why are they being allowed to do that? Where are the police? Where are the counter protesters? But this is the district of cannabis, the new mile high city. 95% of the people voted for the Biden Harris ticket. And that kind of behavior is acceptable. The J6 people go up Capitol Hill after the Capitol Hill police invite them in and FBI informants kind of scam them in. Mm -hmm. And okay, they can, they'll, they'll crack down on that. The people are in prison now when they walked up that hill thinking that it was legal to do so. I don't condone the, the few who walked up there with weapons and got violent with the police in any stretch of the imagination. But most of those folks didn't even know what they were doing was not allowed. They were just walking up the hill to protest, and yet they're in jail, and we get these River to the Sea bandits defacing statues that are you know, 100 years older or more. It's like, what is this crazy? So these are the symbols of the Harris-Biden regime mm -hmm. and the underlying policies that They'll put people like me in prison, Steve Bannon in prison in a heartbeat, and they'll let those bandits do whatever the hell they want. It's just wrong. It is. And if he, as you say, stays on policy, follows your book, The 100 Steps in 100 Days, we can guarantee Trump will be walking back into that Oval Office as the 47th president. And I'd like to see that. I'd like to see sanity come back to this nation. When you go into the grocery store and when Trump was in office, you can buy eggs for 99 cents. You're now going in there. You're lucky if you can get them for three dollars. A no. gallon of gas was on average a dollar eighty nine. I bought it at a dollar sixty nine the day before the election. And now I drive past this three twenty nine. Yeah. The price the prices of the average family is just so astronomical. Two bags of groceries for two hundred. No, a lot of families can't afford that. And if they can't afford the food, they can't afford the medication. They can't afford the clothing. They can't afford to go out to dinner or take their kids to McDonald's. Because now McDonald's is $20, $30, $40 that they don't have. And what they have done is they've, they've taken the middle and lower class and just crushed them underneath their thumb and say, you're going to like it and you're going to take it. But if we stay on the economic message and the message of the border, I think we have the, the we have it. Mm, we've got it. It's it's the winning hand. I mean, look, in in Trump's America, you didn't have to choose I mean, food on the table, medicine in the cabinet, or a roof over your head. I mean, that's that's a core kitchen table issue. And and when it, when it costs as much to go to McDonald's as it used to cost to go to I don't know, Peter's lobster. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Things are going in the wrong direction. I mean, no wonder the Red Lobster went out of business. It's like they can't they can't survive at the prices they're having to charge. McDonald, I, so I don't. It's like let's stay focused, folks, on policy. I think I think in terms of reaching out to um, the swing voters, I think it, folks like Ted Cruz. Um, Lindsey Graham, Tom Cotton, these older white guys who want to impose their ultra-conservative views on Democrat women 
on behalf of Donald Trump, that's not doing us any good and doesn't even reflect Donald Trump. Those guys should just shut up. I, I mean, I am sick of Lindsey Graham. Lindsey Graham. He's my oh, senator. Four <laughs> votes. <laughs> and anybody in the Senate popping off the way he does. He, his, I don't even know how he keeps getting elected because his political instincts are so bad. I just don't want to hear those guys. I want to see folks like you talking about these issues. I mean, the, the one thing, look, the Harris crowd, they're going to do orange man bad. They're going to, they're going to go low on Trump and just, they, they, they got, they're not calling him Hitler anymore because somebody actually took a shot at him and they took, so they're calling him weird. It's no different. Weird equals Hitler. It's the same kind of hate. It's the same kind of hate. They got that that they're going to do. And what else they got? They got abortion, abortion, abortion. And then they got the, the race baby. The race card. The white, yeah. women, the white women for Kamala. The white men for Kamala. Can you imagine if we did that kind of stuff like that? How racist that would seem? It's exactly. obscene. But yeah. even on the abortion thing, I mean... We don't need to talk about that. But if you think about how extreme the Democrat position is compared to Donald Trump, it's like, OK, abortion right up to birth. It's like, really? Um, that's extreme. So the big issues voters care about. Inflation, the economy, border security, foreign policy weaponization of the justice system, law and order, and this, this suite of woke issues on whether it's DEI in the corporations or the Pentagon or our schools, whether it's the men participating in women's sports, the in focus on these gender issues in K through 12 rather than reading, writing, and arithmetic. It's like the center of the Democratic Party is disgusted by that. So we need to kind of go after that constituency. We go after working class Democrats on the economy and border security. We go after everybody on foreign policy. The last thing, the time I looked, a nuclear weapon or a cyber strike on America doesn't distinguish between Democrats and Republicans. No. That's Boom! It. Hits everybody. Yeah. Kamala Harris puts it at risk because they don't respect or fear her, and she doesn't understand foreign policy. And what's she going to do? Farming out to Tony Blinken? Come on. Oh, Come on. He's the architect of everything that's going wrong right now. Yeah. Well, listen, I'm looking down. We're running out of time. Wow. It went real fast. It has been so much fun. i got to tell you, honestly, the first presidential election I voted in, I did not vote for Jimmy Carter. <laughs> I can well, guarantee that. He that, was the worst president we've had until Joe Biden came along. Yeah. Uh, and um, I think it's fair to say, I, go back and find me a worse vice president than Kamala Harris. I mean, I was in the White House for four years. I would put my record in terms of getting things done constructively for the American people in the White House helping President Trump against hers. I helped draft more executive orders than any other senior White House advisor in the West Wing on behalf and at the direction of Donald Trump. I negotiated the successful end to two labor strikes. I went over to Geneva and negotiated a universal postal agreement that nobody said I could pull off. Saved the shipyard in Philly helped another one get stronger in Marinette, Wisconsin, saved two tank plants in Ohio, uh, helped build an F-16 plant in South Carolina. And it wasn't me doing it. It was me because when I spoke, I had Donald Trump behind me with his blessing and people listened. She hadn't done anything. And the one thing she was asked to do, Kamala, hey, explain this to me president says go secure the border and you say not my job do you think if the president 
told J.D. Vance to go down the border and secure that, he would do that? No, he'd say, sir, yes, sir. And he'd do it. Yep. yep. So anyway, newmagadeal.com. Please check this out. Newmagadeal.com is the website. The book is the New Maga Deal, Unofficial Deplorables Guide to Trump's 2024 Policy Platform. That's the keyword policy. It's also on Amazon if you're a Prime member and you want to get it fast. And use it as I'm trying to do as a secular Bible to preach the gospel of policy, how Trump will make you safer, more secure and prosperous as he did in his first term. Well, God bless you, Peter, and give your, your fiance an extra hug. <laughs> she is a wonderful lady. Like I said, don't yes. let it go. And yes. people can find you at newmagadeal.com. And you've got to come back because I had questions about China and a whole mess of other things. All I right. barely got through the first two questions I wrote down. <laughs> but we love well, you. Good. Your all fellow right. was on. Okay. We talk with our hands. <laughs> all right. We do that. Yes. All right. You all take right. care. Bye. Peter Navarro, check him out, newmagadeal.com. And I always love having him with us on the show. But that's all we got for today. Uh, we will be back uh, next week. Mark Tapscott will be joining us from the Epic Times. And we will have a lot of fun. So I leave you with that. And Curtis will not be here. Ted Yoho instead will be substituting. A former congressman, Ted Yoho, will sit in for Curtis as my co-host next week. So until then, I say good night. And God bless. I'm praying for this land I love, America, America, the home of the free. But there are people making plans. To change America They've no respect for her Or what matters most to me That's why I stand for the flag And I kneel at the cross Mom, for the friends I have loved and lost In nasty you believe We God we trust the freedom I fall for these grand us I hope it's not too late to save America Do you hear our that cry across America? We've got to rescue her, you know it's up to me and you to see the truth behind their eyes Don't change America God bless America And the red, white, and blue That's why I stand for the flag And I kneel at the cross No, for the friends I have loved and lost And I still America
can save America.